Hi, my name is Christian Tefel and I'm a digital painter. Within the next few minutes, I would like to show you how I work. First, let me say a few words about my tools. Currently, I'm working with a Wacom Cintiq 22 HD touch pen display. I chose this tool out of Wacom boards because it is the one that closest resembles traditional techniques and is nicely customizable. You can set the buttons of the pen. I have the eraser at the top and the right click at the bottom and Alt is the pipette. The express keys on the right are hand, fit on screen, zoom and the brush panel. These are the ones I use most often while painting. In this part, you can select the functions of the touch strip, which is at the back of the display. Here, I use brush size. I think it's a great idea and saves you a lot of time. I set the top ones to undo, save, tab, and alt. On the left, I roughly left the factory settings because I'm left-handed and mainly use the right side. You have a lot of configuration options, from the pressure sensitivity of the pen to customizing the express buttons and the touch. You can assign custom commands to each button, so the display can be used totally without a mouse or keyboard, which helps to avoid distractions from work. This is very important. Like every painting, this one also begins with a sketch. In this case, I have already drawn it, because the final plan comes very slowly for me. I use the unused pieces of an old photo series of mine as reference. For the sketch layer, I set the blending mode to multiply, which will make the sketch layer transparent in the proportions of its brightness, so we can see the underlying layer better. The next step is blocking in the sketch with a medium tone of the face. Currently, I am using a wet acrylic brush in large size, which gently blurs together the layers of paint and is very similar to the conventional acrylic technique. In the brush settings, I usually set the opacity to 85%, so the individual layers won't completely overlap. The brush strokes will be visible, and the sterile computer graphic effects, which I really don't like, disappears. This is a small thing, but it changes the texture of the image a lot. This is more important in Photoshop, that's true. However, here in Painter, the traditional tools are simulated better. I usually paint in Photoshop, but Painter 2015 is a very well-made update. It is more stable and the particle brushes are very good too. First, I'm working on the rough parts of the eyes, the nose and the mouth, with a smaller brush size and with the opacity mentioned above. These are the most important elements of a portrait. They can convey the most emotion in a painting. That's the most important thing for me. It doesn't matter how well a picture is painted if it fails to invoke emotion from the viewer. In the meantime, I've switched to Photoshop, where I'm painting the lips with a chalk brush, making use of the pen's pressure sensitivity. I love this basic brush, and I think that this is the one I mainly use for most of my works. You can see how easy it is to set the size of the brush with the touch strip at the back. This, the other express keys, and the fact that I don't have to use external peripherals at all greatly contribute to the painting being completed as soon as possible. This is a very important factor when working on an order with a deadline. Of course, I always leave the painting to rest if I can, so when I come back to it a few days later, I can see the errors better and notice what needs to be changed. I'm going to carry on with the painting with a smaller brush here. I am forming the highlights of the nose with small but powerful lines. These tiny lines are very important when forming skin texture. These will make the painting look realistic. However, for this portrait, the goal is not photorealism, but rather a rough painting technique. I usually don't pay that much attention to forming the neck and ears. I just apply rough brush strokes. I usually paint in a way that I develop pretty much everything on the same level, then I go round and round until each part reaches its final form. Some people fully develop one part and then move on to the next one. Everyone has their own way and does as they feel comfortable.
The details of the lips are very important. I form the tiny grooves and holes with a small brush and a few different shades. The best thing is to get the color of the lips with the pipette. Then create the tiny cracks with lines two or three shades darker and lighter, which will provide texture and depth to one of the most expressive parts of the face. However, we must always pay attention not to give too much detail to the part of the nose that's close to the eyes or the part of the lips that's close to the nose. I hold that these three components should be developed to more or less the same depth. The rest can be vague or sketchy. I sometimes tend to over sophisticate, then I always unsophisticate to match the other parts. Of course, this is not true when the goal is photorealism. In that case, everything must be worked out very thoroughly and each section requires much more time. This is something you must pay attention to when working on custom work. At last, Photoshop's new update has made the great advantages of the Wacom Touch display available. The touch controlled zoom and rotation. This feature has been greatly missed from Photoshop because it greatly contributes to speeding up the work. So a great big hooray! I am now working on the eyelashes, which I am forming with small dynamic lines. For the shape dynamics, it's useful to switch to the size jitter because it makes the end of the lines get narrower with decreasing pen pressure, which is very good when drawing eyelashes. A basic round brush is perfect for painting eyelashes. We don't need any fancy customized brushes. As I mentioned before, the pen display can be used without a keyboard or a mouse. It can be rotated, tilted and touch controlled. This is the only tool which truly resembles the traditional painting and drawing techniques. In practice, it's like if we work directly on paper or canvas. All this with the many advantages of digital painting over conventional techniques. You don't have to bother with drying time. You can try different colors and moods in separate layers which you can discard with a single click if you don't like them, then continue where you left off. You can return to previous phases, you can save multiple versions for your client or yourself, and you can go on working on them later. You don't have to wash the brushes, you don't have to sit and wait for canvases or paint if the shops don't have them. It all saves you time, which is very important today when doing custom work, not to mention inhaling the chemicals. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not speaking against traditional techniques. Instead, I'm advocating digital ones. Especially as digital painting is on its way to being accepted as art and not disregarded as only Photoshop. Thank God, technology is so advanced today that it is very difficult for a layman to tell whether digital or traditional technique was used for a piece of work. I'm working on the lips again. I'm refining the small cavities further, which makes the result look much more realistic. I'll paint some more over these so that the detail integrates better. In the meantime, I've changed from Photoshop to Painter, where I'm starting to paint the clothes with my finger. I usually use my fingers with conventional techniques too, for example for smearing. And it's so great that Cintiq lets you do it in a digital painting as well. I won't develop the clothes too well because I don't really consider it essential. And it distracts from the essence of the portrait, the face. I always try to choose simple clothes, such as a white shirt or a simple top. The dress in the reference photo did not fit into my idea so much. It was too modern. So I painted a shirt with a laced collar instead.
Here I'm setting the opacity control of the brush to pen pressure and I'm going to develop the clothes with large strokes. First I am painting the clothes schematically and only then will I start doing the shadows and highlights. I am not using the acrylic brush to develop the collar. I am choosing a 2B pencil instead. The pencil is very useful in this case to elaborate the lace. Since the Wacom pen is tilt sensitive, it behaves as a conventional pencil when shading, giving it a very good texture to the lace material. You can see how I am forming the material of the collar with small circular movements. I didn't feel it necessary to elaborate the detail of the lace because it would mean hours of work and would not greatly alter the final result. Of course, there are times when the clothes play an important role, and it is worth working hours on it, but not now. I'll create a new layer over the face and the neck. I'm changing from the pencil to an acrylic brush and this is how I'll start working on the hair. I usually form the hair by sketching the direction with two or three shades, the dark and light areas and the density. This is a very important step in the painting of hair, as the hair colour is decided here, how dark or light it will be. Also this layer will be visible on the final result, as the hairs will be painted over it later. In the meantime, I've gone back to Photoshop, and I'm setting the brush texture. You can see how sterile the brush is without texture or texture depth. As I've adjusted the depth to 16%, it is perfect for painting the hair, because the brush has become more airy and sparse. I don't only use brush texture to paint hair, but it is nearly always set to help avoid extensive sterility. Any image or pattern can be set as texture under the brush tab. Here, as I said before, I am beginning to develop the hairs and I am trying to integrate the dividing line between the hair and the skin as much as I can. It is very important that the skin is always darker around the dividing line and the hairs also make shades. Until we do this, the whole thing feels a bit like if she's had a wig on her head. I paint this on the layer of the hair or under the hair with a larger brush. In the next step, I'll neglect the hair for a while and start developing the flower. As always, I'll sketch it quickly and then paint the darker and lighter parts and the finer details. In this case, I imagined a simple but intense flower pinned into the hair. I'm painting with a basic chalk brush, but I have set the brush texture here, too, which makes it easier to paint the details. Practically anything can be painted with this brush, there is no need for individual brushes. As I'm painting the flower on the separate layer, I don't have to mind the outlines, because in the next step, I'll simply flip the pen and erase the excess parts. After that, only the pistol of the flower is left, which I'll form with simple lines and dots. I'm creating a new layer under the flower, where I'm going to paint the shadow of the flower. Later, I'll set the layer's opacity back to 70 or 80%, making the hair under the shadow minimally visible, so that the shade will be more believable. Many people have asked me what makes my work look like paintings. It's because I paint them, of course. But it is very important what brush we use, and how we adjust them. As already mentioned, I usually set the brush's opacity to 85%. I turn on the shape dynamics and set texture to the brush too. One more thing that's very important, I paint on canvas. I either start by painting on a canvas texture, or the picture gets a canvas pattern under or over it during post-processing. I apply my own textures when I can, 
because now it's not difficult to photograph a good texture, but of course, the internet is full of sites with legal textures. I give these textures different strengths, depending on the painting, to reach the desired effect. Here I'm painting the shadow of the hair, which I mentioned before, on a new layer of course, under the layer of the hair. I'm working with a large round brush, which makes it possible to create subtle gradations between the shadow and the tones of the skin. When elaborating the hairs, it's important to work with as many shades and brush sizes as we can, to make the hair more varied and authentic. I'm detailing with sweeping movements, while keeping the direction until I reach the desired effect. In the case of clearly visible light hairs, I switch off the brush texture, because it somewhat blunts and fades the lines. These bright hairs are very important because they give the hair shine and flair. First, I planned a long hanging earring, but as it spoiled the composition, I chose to paint a simple pearl instead. Developing the pearl is very easy. It can be done with practically three shades. I painted the shine and the highlights of the lips with a small round brush. I knew from the beginning and I designed the painting so that the figure would be put into an oval frame in order to improve the archaic effect. Here I'll simply select the oval shape and then wipe off the excess parts. I usually leave some unfinished detail. Here I'm destroying the clothes, then I'm adding a layer mask to the hair layer to delete parts of the hair that way. Since I'm using a layer mask, it can set it back to the original state any time, which is very useful. To increase texture and make the picture darker, I'm doubling the canvas layer and increasing the unwanted parts again. I wanted to prepare the tears so that it would look more like a swept away spot or stain, rather than a tear running down her cheek. I took a sample of the eye makeup color with the pipette, and I created the patch around the eye with it. Here, again, I use a chalk brush with which the paint can be blurred perfectly. I'll still paint a vague tear that runs down her cheek, just to make an impact. I'm creating a narrow band around the frame of the new layer to make the oval shape and the vintage effect more intense. Once selected, I'm forming it so that it would not be filled uniformly everywhere, but I'm painting this a little incompletely and roughly as well, and I'm getting the paint back as needed with the help of a layer mask. I'm starting to create the pearls under the collar, which I am painting with the same technique as the earring. It is a very small, not very visible accessory, but it contributes greatly to the atmosphere of the painting. I'll simply erase the lines that veered off the contour of the neck by flipping the pen. I am painting the freckles that I like so much one by one, but of course, sometimes I use a custom brush that is made up of lots of tiny dots. I still think that too much of the clothes is visible, so I'm getting the paint back with the help of a layer mask to make it look incomplete or scratched. To break the simplicity of the flower, I started to paint it as having been melted or leaking. I have used this effect with previous paintings before, so I didn't have any particular problem with it, and I already knew what I wanted to see. Connecting the flows with tiny lines gives the feeling that it is a liquid, waxy substance even greater. Here I have integrated the layers and the tiny sparkles and I am painting the lights. On a separate layer, where I set the blending mode to hard light so that the layer will have a strong contrast, I am starting to paint the bottom and the corners of the picture, dark for a stronger impact and to lead the viewer's eyes to the face in the middle. In general, I always paint darker, then I set the desired shade by adjusting the opacity of the layer. 
a few hairs to go and I'll declare the painting finished. Thank you for being with me. I hope I was able to provide you with some useful information and that you enjoyed watching the video. Create and paint a lot. Bye.